Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ray. I am a detransition male, and today we are going to be debunking the criticisms of autogonophilia as a scientific theory. Because I um, saw this thread in Reddit where someone watched one of my videos or watched some of my videos about AGP and, you know, said, hey, you know, I'm not sure about this. I, I, I don't feel good, you know. Um, and then, of course, everyone in the comments on Reddit is like, well, autogonophilia is not real. It's been debunked. It's a fake diagnosis, discredited quack. And then this person says, autogonophilia has been officially and exhaustively debunked by qualified scientists many times over. And then, um, then they link to uh, this scientific paper here that supposedly debunks um, autogynephilia called sexual behavior desire. So I'm actually going to look at that paper and let's see if it actually debunks the theory of autogynephilia. So they say that, um, you know, they, they, they talk about AGP and they say that in light of Blanchard's typology, so they're trying to test Blanchard's typology, and, and, and they're making certain hypotheses based on the assumption that Blanchard's typology is true, and then they're going to test, supposedly test for those hypotheses to see if Blanchard's typology stands up to the light of empirical evidence. So um, one hypothesis is that significantly more gynophilic trans women would report sexual arousal in association with cross-dressing than androphilic trans women. So that does seem reasonable. That is what the theory predicts. They also predict that gynophilic trans women would show significantly higher solitary sexual desire and less dyadic sexual desire and behavior than androphilic trans women. No, not necessarily. I don't see why Blanchard's theory would predict that because autosexuality is compatible with only um, some aspect of your um, some aspect of your sexuality being solitary, and also the existence of pseudo bisexuality or the manifestation of the autosexuality in the desire to have sex with men to validate one's autosexuality. So many AGPs are interested in sex, but they're interested in sex in order to satisfy the autosexuality. So I don't think that this is actually a prediction of Blanchard's typology because the AGP can manifest in dyadic sexual desire particularly because dyadic sexual desire is one of the ways in which AGP gets manifested, particularly what Blanchard calls behavioral or interpersonal um, AGP, such that you have arousal at the idea of being treated like a woman. Well, one of the main ways to be treated like a woman is in the context of sexual behavior. So the, the manifest, the desire for a dyadic sexual desire can be a manifestation of AGP. Uh, another prediction is that sexuality and sexual fantasies would play a central role in the lives and, and transitioning process of gynephilic trans women and significantly more gynephilic than androphilic trans women would claim to be to have been motivated to transition by sexual desire and the desire to realize sexual fantasies. So this is obviously false. The, the theory of autogynephilia does not predict this whatsoever. The, the typology does not predict this. Why? Because trans women are aware, like that saying that my transition was motivated by sexual desire, that is taboo. That is, you know, this is, like shameful like so tr trans women are not going to admit this even if at an unconscious level that is the motivation so trying to get people to admit that they're motivated by sexuality they're not going to do that because they know well most also most trans women know about the theory of agp to some extent and they know that it's pseudoscientific and it's transphobic and they kind of know that you can't just walk around in public saying this because you're gonna, you know, have people, you know, challenge your 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 transition for better or worse. That's just how it is. So there's gonna be strong motivation to downplay 
the fact that your transition is motivated by sexual desire, and often you can be unconsciously fooled. You can sort of not have insight into your own motivations, but that doesn't mean that those motivations aren't there at the unconscious level. Furthermore, because it has been suggested that autogynophilia can be considered a paraphilia, we hypothesize that gynophilic trans women may show evidence of heightened sexual desire. No, that's not necessarily true. Um, the because the the AGP can also show up in asexuality, so you can have asexual an asexual trans woman who knew, who who is attracted to um, femininity but is asexual. That that can be just as much a display of um, a, a, a of AGP compared to a non asexual person. And furthermore, it's it's more like a sexual orientation, and a sexual orientation is compatible with a low libido. So, you don't necessarily have to have a high libido to have a paraphilic sexual orientation. Like, like you don't have to be a sex fiend to have <laughs> AGP. Um, gynephilic trans women may have a particularly negative psychological experience of sexuality. I mean that that is probably true. Um, so, and, and their conclusion is that ultimately the study found little evidence for the hypothesis that sexual behavior, sexual desire, and psychosexual experience differ substantially in gynophilic, exclusively gynophilic and bisexual, and androphilic trans women. So that, that is supposedly a, you know, uh, evidence against AG, AGP because the Blanchardian typology predicts that it's your sexual orientation, whether or not you're gynophilic or androphilic, um, is driving a lot of the se sexual behavior in regards to uh, the development of gender dysphoria and transition, et cetera. So if that conclusion is, is right, then that would pose a challenge for Blanchard's theory. But first of all, let's think about how did they even distinguish between the gynophilic and the androphilic, like how did they measure that? Well, one of the things they do is that participants were further questioned with regard to current sexual behavior, whom they currently feel most attracted to sexually, a seven point Kinsey scale. Okay, so they say that um, in order to group people into the androphilic versus the gynophilic versus the bisexual, Participants who stated to be exclusively attracted to men were categorized as androphilic, and those who stated to feel attracted to both sexes, at least occasionally, were classified um, as bisexual. Par participants who expressed exclusively attraction to women were classified as exclusively gynophilic. That is not the right way to measure androphilia and gynophilia, and, and, and it is not how Blanchard actually measured this, because... You can be AGP, which is inverted heterosexuality, and you can grow up your entire life being into women. And then once you transition, your quote unquote sexual orientation changes. And then now you can state that you're only interested in men, even though that interested in men, according to Blanchard, is pseudo interested in men. It is meta attraction. It is attraction to men because being attracted to men is a way to validate the AGP. So you can't just take people's self-report. Like you, you can't just ask someone, are you attracted to men or are you attracted to women? And then like, based on that, like determine whether or not someone is truly androphilic or truly gynophilic. Because if you look at Blanchard's original paper on the typology of male to female transsexualism, he actually used something called the autogynophilia and the gynophilia scales. Um, so, uh, the Freund et al. 1982 called them the androphilia scale and the gynophilia scale. Um, so these are actually scales that measure um, that actually measure gynophilia versus androphilia, and and, and this is much more. And in, in the in the appendix, you can actually see what that um, scale looks like. So the modified androphilia scale, like how old were you when you first felt sexually attracted to males? What qualities did you like in males to whom you were sexually attracted? Um, you know, would you have preferred, you know, male homosexual partners? 
Um, since age 16 and up, how, how did the preferred age of male partners change as you got older? Since what age have, have you been sexually attracted to males only? Since age 18, how old was the oldest male to whom you could have felt sexually attracted? Would you have preferred a male partner? Um, so I, as you can see, this is much more elaborate than simply asking currently, are you attracted to men or are you attracted to women? Because as you transition, as an AGP transition, they can often you know, go from being a married heterosexual who's only ever dated women and had sex with women their entire life. And then, um, and then later, once they transition, then they suddenly say that, oh, now I'm only into men. And, and then this study would say that those people were androphilic. So you can't actually assume that these androphilic trans women are truly of the homosexual type. So in terms of this study, look, they say that of the androphilic type that they studied, well, one, there's only like N, N of 17, the sex of the, of the first sex partner, 40% um, of the supposedly and androphilic um, trans women said that their first sex partner was female. Well, that's not necessarily super androphilic of the type that Blanchard was talking about in the true homosexual transsexuals. Um, okay, so here, here's another thing. Um, sexual arousal in association with, in association with cross-dressing. Um, experiences of, of sexual arousal while cross-dressing ages 12 to 18 71% of the gynophilic um, showed arousal with cross-dressing. 54% showed arousal um, with uh, the bisexuals. And 25% showed arousal with the, with the androphiliacs. Well, that sort of, um, you know, supports the original uh, grouping that Blanchard found. But in the age 18 plus years, 85% of the gynephilic showed arousal. 53% showed arousal um, in the bisexual. And 41% showed arousal in the androphilic. So what they're saying here is they actually say... Um, Uh, although significantly more gynephilic trans women than androphilic trans women reported having experienced sexual arousal in association with cross-dressing, at least occasionally, this is not the case when comparing bisexual to androphilic trans women. In this case, the number of reports of sexual arousal with cross-dressing differed by less than 10%. So they're saying that, whereas Blanchard originally said that the gynephilics and the bisexuals are more similar compared to the bisexuals and the androphiliacs, that they're, they're trying to say that the, there's not, not really a big difference between the bisexuals and the androphiliacs in regards to arousal and association with cross-dressing. Well, as I already showed, they're not properly measuring, measuring whether someone is androphilic. So most likely, a lot of these androphiliacs are actually AGPs who have meta-attraction, who only later came to become exclusively attracted to men, even though you know, they were originally thought of themselves as heterosexual their entire life, and only later did they become in, in, in interested in men, which is called meta attraction or pseudo bisexuality. It's not true. It's not true androphilia. It's androphilia only in service of the um, validation of one's womanhood. Like. And this is, um, so it, it's, it's not actual the same. So this doesn't actually disprove Blanchard's typology because, and not, also you can see that um, the arousal is different in terms of the, of the age because the androphiliacs are, you know, uh, as you get older, that, that's where the meta attraction is more likely to uh, show up. So yeah, you're going to see more, um, arousal in the supposedly and in, in, in groups um, after you age because that's where the 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 pseudo the the pseudo bisexuality comes in because these are not probably actually angiophiliacs um, and then the other thing is they're saying um, let's see they say um, yeah they're saying 
attributed importance to sexuality. So they predict that if you're out of, if you're out of gynophile, then you're going to sort of, and they predict that the autogynophiles would attribute more importance to sexuality um, compared to the non the non AGPs because supposedly the AGPs, if it's like a paraphilia, as Blanchard said, then um, you know they would uh, want to hold on to 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 their sexuality. Well, it's not actually true because on Anne Lawrence's model of AGP characterized as a sexual orientation there's a romantic and emotional side to the sexual orientation such that you can even if the importance of sexuality diminishes as you go on hrt and nuclear and nuke your libido you might not be interested in in in, in your sexuality because your, your libido has been nuked by the hrt but the emotional and romantic attachment to the idea of oneself as a woman carries on because sexual orientations have both an erotic element and an emotional um, and romantic opponent. So this actually doesn't disprove uh, Blanchard's typology either. Sexual desire as a motive for gender affirmation. Only 14% uh, of the gynophiliacs admitted that sexual desire admitted a role compared to 29% of the androphiliacs. Well, like I said, these androphiliacs are more likely to be AGPs who have pseudo bisexuality, which is characterized by a sexual interest in um, having their their womanhood affirmed through sexual activity. So, of course, these meta attraction AGPs are going to be more interested in sexuality because that interpersonal affirmation of being treated like a woman in sex is part of AGP because these aren't actual androphiliacs. They're AGPs who are expressing meta attraction, um, and and also most people are not going to admit that um, you know that their sexual fantasies played a role in making a, a, a decision to transition because they're not going to be honest about this. You can't trust self-report. This is why Blanchard used things like the modified um, AGP scale. Um, like, uh, because you, you have to rely on objective psychometric data. Um, you, you can't rely, and you have to make an inference from that objective psychometric data because people are likely to distort their true motivations because it is not socially sanctioned to say that. So of course they're going to deny that, they're gonna downplay that in a self-report because they are aware of the social um, factors that go into saying that sexual fantasies played a role in making your decision to transition because that's very taboo. Trans women don't like to admit that. Um, Especially since this was published in 2020, yeah, in 2020, most trans most trans people are aware of Blanchard's theory, and so of course they're going to downplay that. Um. So yeah, th this whole theory is just totally flawed because, like, the the like fundamental flaw is they're not actually measuring androphilia in the way that Blanchard did originally. So it's not surprising to see <laughs> different results here and sort of saying that sexual orientation doesn't predict these different factors of your transition or your motivations for, for, for transitions or it doesn't have the same impact on, on behavior. Well, unless you're measuring androphilia and gynophilia in the same way that Blanchard did, you're not actually testing Blanchard's typology because Blanchard's typology is based on a different measure of androphilia. So of course it's not going to be the same. So you can't draw the same conclusions. And so the, the whole study is, fun, is fundamentally flawed. And um, so yeah, it, it's not actually a disproof of Blanchard's typology and it's just like wrong headed bad science. <laughs> and so this whole idea that like AGP has been debunked or oh, it's been debunked. No, it's not, hasn't been debunked because people 
haven't actually replicated the same studies using the same measures that Blanchard did because Blanchard was more careful. He was he, he was like much more careful in, in how he measured gynophilia and androphilia and AGP compared to the, the these other people and and a lot of the assumptions that they made in terms of like what does Blanchard's typology predict like what hypotheses does it predict like those are that's not the hypotheses that you can derive from the theory so if you disprove those hypotheses it doesn't disprove the theory because those theory actually doesn't make those hypotheses okay that's it for this video thanks for watching take